wage. So both of those demographic factors are putting pressure on budgets, and we also have increased. We also have the pressure from the national living wage, which has already been talked about. I want to emphasise a little put a little bit of emphasis on the whole way in which social care is fragmented. And this may be part of an answer to your sort of question, Barbara, about why aren't people getting more agitated and more angry. So that we already have variations between the countries of the UK. And I assume they were talking about England primarily, but even within England, there are big variations between local authorities. And part of what I would argue is that those variations are going to increase. So what you get in terms of social care <coughs> will increasingly depend on where you live. And the reason for that is that over the next few years, the government will be phasing out the rate support grant, which tries to equalize the money that lo different local authorities have and help to match the money that they have to their local needs. That would be replaced by uh, local authorities' ability to keep the whole of their business rates. And of course, the problem is that the income you get from business rates bears no necessary relationship to the number of older people you have in your constituency or your, your, your local authority. It bears no relationship to the number of uh, severely disabled people that you have. It bears no relationship to the number of carers, family carers, who need support. Um, and the 2% council precept, will all, the money that that will bring in will all also vary between local authorities. And some very early analysis that's been done of the impact of the 2% council tax precept has showed, suggests that there is an inverse relationship between the numbers of older people and the numbers of carers within a local authority and the revenue, the money that will be brought in. So that areas that have got local authorities with very high numbers of older people, high numbers of carers, are less likely to be able to raise significant amounts of money through the 2% precept. And that's assuming that there is a political decision to um, raise that full uh, 2%. So my argument is that there's going to be increasing variations between local authorities. Uh, because of these changes to the underpinning funding uh, of, uh, of local authorities. Uh, and of course, uh, Barbara and David also talked about the spending cuts, uh, had six years of cuts, a massive uh, funding gap, 26 million people uh, getting care, largely as a result, and, and that's on top of the increased demand from the demographic changes. Um, and that's generally because local authorities have increased, raised their thresholds of eligibility for care. So something like 90% of local authorities now uh, restrict uh, social care to people who have only the highest level, critical or substantial level needs. Um, you've already heard, yeah, research, I mean, the, the latest figure I've got is a million older people uh, who have problems with at least one activity of daily living, getting out of bed, washing, bathing, toileting, and so on. One million older people who are not getting care. Uh, any care from either um, family or from social services. Increasing numbers of people who are therefore buying care themselves out of their own money, out of their own pockets. 41% of the income to uh, that goes to care homes and nursing homes, 41% comes from the fees paid by individuals themselves, not by the local authority. Um, and if you add on people topping up their local authority fees, it comes to well over 50% of the money going into <coughs> care homes is coming from people's own private uh, funding. Uh, we've already heard about the increased pressure on carers, and I'm glad you, I think the, the fact that we, we need to remember that, as you say, increasing numbers of carers are themselves in their 80s and 90s, and I think that's really important. Um, there is increasing evidence of care providers coming under really severe uh, financial pressures, 
home care um, agencies handing back contracts to local authorities because they cannot afford to run services at the um, rate uh, that the local authority is providing, uh, local authority is paying. Um, and within residential care, increasing reliance for, care, for residential care homes of cross subsidies. So people who are able to, who aren't eligible for local authority care, local authority funding, are now um, being charged much higher fees within the care home. People, uh, so they, they are self-funding and they're being charged higher fees and those fees are increasingly important to keep the care home afloat uh, so that they can, the care home can also uh, take people with much lower levels of local authority, uh, low, lower local authority funding. Uh, Barbara's mentioned pressures on the NHS, and I think it's not just delayed discharge, we need to be thinking about but people who are admitted through A&E. And um, again, the King's Fund report shows that uh, if you're elderly and you go to A&E, you have a much higher chance of being admitted than if you're um, under retirement age uh, and attend A&E. Uh, got workforce shortages and Brexit. There's already a big uh, workforce uh, shortage, real problems of recruiting nurses in nursing homes, and Brexit will make that worse, um, or may well make that worse. Um, and we've already also, Barbara's mentioned the, the challenges that in terms of maintaining quality. And <laughs> just to think it's an indication of how serious that is, and we're talking about five years ago now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission did, uh, undertook an inquiry into social care and concluded that the level of the quality of care that people were getting, particularly in, in home care, uh, breached human rights. So, you know, it's just a bit more um, of a sort of expanding on some of the aspects of the crisis. This isn't a new problem. Uh, I mean, I can remember from you know the mid 1990s, John Major going on about you know we need to do something about social care and people having to uh, sell their homes in order to do the care. We've had the uh, the Sutherland Commission on Long Term Care uh, in the noughties, I suppose you call them. Uh, reports from the King, from the Roundtree Foundation, the Dartington Trust, the Smith Foundation, and the King's Fund, all. Uh, putting proposals forward on how to reform the funding of social care. Just before the 2010 election, 2008-2009, uh, there was a big flurry of activity, and a very welcome flurry of activity from the then Labour government, um, a consultation and a green paper, and the beginnings of a discussion about a national care service. And I just want to remember that because I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, and then the Dilmot Commission um, and the proposals there. Um, I should emphasise that the care cap they proposed did not necessarily bring in new money to the system. It redistributed where that money was. <coughs> um, the, um, some of the proposals, or the proposals to the Dinlock Commission, very watered down and contained in the 2014 Care and Support Act, but already the, the care cap raised very considerably. But even that has been postponed till after 2020. <coughs> right, it looks like a very, very sick power. So, there's a long history. People have been talking about reforming social care for a long time. And there has not been any concerted action. And I share your frustration, Barbara, at the, the lack of, um, sort of action uh, and the failure of successive governments to actually take this issue seriously. I'm going to propose some principles that I think should underpin our thinking about how we fund social care. And I am emphasising these really basic principles, because I think unless we get the funding right, then we're not going to deliver uh, good care. We're not going to be in a position to deliver good care. Um, and we're not going to be in a position to develop a sustainable approach to care. 
So I just want us to think for a minute about some of the principles <coughs> that I think should underpin care. <coughs> um, so first of all, the absolute basic principle, which is that there should be coverage for everybody, something, some coverage, some entitlement for people, for everybody. Uh, those m m people with a, above a certain level of need. It may be that it's concentration of people with the highest level of need um, and that the threshold is set quite high. But that principle of universal entitlement, I think, is really, really important. We have it with the NHS. Nobody <laughs> says, you've got too many, you've got, um, you own your own house or you've got your income is too high to get NHS care. So I think that universal coverage is really important. I think it means that people should also be treated equally regardless of their age. Let's, not, let's think about having similar principles for people, working age people and older people. I think people should be treated similarly, their needs should be treated similarly regardless of a diagnosis. And I know people with dementia very often feel, or families of people with dementia very often feel, that they uh, get less help or treated less favourably than people who have physical uh, disabilities or physical health needs. And going back to my earlier point about the increasing variations between local authorities, um, I think people should be treated the same regardless of where they live. And you may want to have a debate about whether we're talking about just England or whether we're talking about the UK. I said earlier that I think um, it should be a basic principles of entitlement. And I think it's important to bear in mind that social care is not just about helping the NHS out of the difficult problem, helping to improve the uh, efficiency and throughput of the acute hospital sector. Social care is about quality of life. It's about a decent quality of life. And ultimately, it's about how we uh, treat, uh, as a society, treat older and disabled people in terms of their citizenship rights. And I think that is a really important principle we need to bear in mind. I think we do have to look at how we um, raise funds for social care. The 2% precept is an interesting sort of precedent because it's almost a hypothecated uh, sum of money. It has to be spent on social care. Um, but we need to, do need to be thinking about um, <coughs> taxation, perhaps increased taxation, perhaps hypothecated, perhaps reinvented. We do need to be thinking about social insurance um, as a way of getting more money into social care. And I think there's no way around that. Um, and then, so on top of a very basic uh, coverage, uh, user charges might fill the gaps. And I'm afraid I would disagree with Barbara. I would argue that support for family carers, I think, needs to be built into an overarching, comprehensive approach to thinking about social care. Um, and I would just illustrate that by saying, uh, by pointing what, to what other countries do. So this is from an OECD report, which says the majority of OECD, gov OECD governments have set up collectively financed schemes for personal and nursing care costs. And many are also moving towards universal entitlements to coverage of long-term care costs. So in, the, in that we still have a highly means-tested system and a system which looks like it is going to vary increasingly depending on where you live. We are moving further away from what our, mo most other developed uh, countries are doing. And if you look at the reforms um, in other countries, they are underpinned by uh, the principle that funding for care is a collective responsibility, in the same way that funding for the health service is a collective responsibility. Uh, a big motive um, for reforms in, in some countries has been to reduce those local variations, the variations between provinces um, and localities. There's uh, principles of entitlement, 
there is a consistent process of assessment, which means that you, where you're assessed, where you live, uh, does not depend, uh, does, you know, the assessment doesn't vary according to where you live. And there is a withdrawal, the gradually phasing out of approaches that start with a means test or an assets test. And the other principle, which I'm sure Simon will pick up as well, is that people sh may well want to have choice about having services or about having cash. And that should be a choice. And, and many other reforms, uh, reforms in other countries, have introduced that, that choice. So, for example, Could you touch on this? I'd like to just tell you. Yeah, that's my last one. So, for example, um, Netherlands, Germany, France, Japan, South Korea have all introduced mandatory social insurance to cover care costs. Um, Australia and the US currently have government commissions uh, sitting to look at trying to find sustainable settlements for care. Um, and closer to home, let's remember that Scotland has introduced free personal care for older people, and Wales has introduced a cap on charges for home care. So, you know, we can be considerably more generous than we are, even without a more radical uh, reform. Thank you.